cards in your favor when it comes to your finances. This is the Get Ready for the Future show. And welcome into the Get Ready for the Future show. Scott Inman is away today. We have none other than Chad Roller in the middle seat here. I don't know if you can handle the, the, <laughs> the hey. back and forth here. Listen, I, I'm He's ready. I'm ready for the madness. Uh, good, good. Bl- it's March Madness. He's it ready is March for it. Madness. Yeah, uh, and it's mad out there for sure. Chad Roller from our Conway office. Janet Walker, one of the co-founders of Gen Wealth Financial Advisors, along with yours truly here on the Get Ready for the Future show. Guys, let's start with the the big news. The obvious thing is uh, all the bank uh, stories and and drama that's going on. And so what we always love to do on the Get Ready for the Future show is to try to put things in context to help you understand what's going on out there. So uh, if you've been confused by all of the news about Silicon Valley Bank, let's tell you the why behind what has happened. Now, everybody knows that the bank failed uh, and uh, depositors couldn't get their money on Friday. Then the Fed had to step in and do all kinds of things. But let's talk about the why behind this. And I think it's important that everybody understand that this all started with COVID. Now, you may say, well, what does COVID have to do with anything as far as a bank failure is concerned? But bear with us a little bit because we are education driven here at Gen Wealth, and we want you to understand the why behind the goings on in the financial markets. So when we had COVID, guys, you remember that the Fed flooded the, the economy with money. Yeah. And that was some of that was needed. But we spent lots and lots and lots of money, more money than has ever been spent in the history of the federal government. At the same time, we had the economy basically shut down. And that led to the inflation that we're dealing with right now. So you have to kind of follow the bouncing ball in this and understand that, that you know, there was so much money that was created this supply-demand imbalance and that is where we are as of today. Yeah, John. So the first lesson of today is the economics 101. Right. right? And that equation for today is too much money in the economy chasing too few goods equals what? It equals inflation. That's higher right. prices. That's right. And, so, and so then the Fed looks around and goes, OK, we've got a problem here. Of course, they had created it, but they're discovering now that they've got a problem with inflation. So they say it's creating misery for a lot of people. We have to do something to tamper this inflation. So the Fed begins to throw cold water on the economy in the form of, here we go, higher interest rates. There we go. This is a key ingredient to the the whole issue with the bank. Meanwhile, totally unrelated to any of this, what you have going on out in California is the uh, venture capitalist and the private equity people are pumping a lot of money into tech companies. And why is that, John? Because of COVID. COVID. Yeah. Right. And and they, they were like, hey, let's uh, ramp up because people are inside and they have to do. Mm-hmm. So let's come up with all these tech gadgets. So here comes all this money into Silicon Valley. Well, what do those tech companies do? They very literally go and put the money in the bank. Now, they didn't just put $250,000 in the bank at the FDIC insurance limit, they put millions and millions of dollars per account in the bank. So Silicon Valley Bank, which courted this particular uh, regime of companies, that's where they were located and they specialized with these startup tech companies, their deposit base literally blew up. It it really did. it was huge. And so when you when you look at what's going on there, they became really flush with cash. And then uh, the they had that massive deposit base there. And that literally, Chad, created a problem for the bank. Now, you don't think that money coming into a bank is a problem, but it is right, because they are regulated yep. right, to some degree. And they there are only certain investments that they can invest that capital in. Right. And, and technically, guys, those those deposits are really liabilities. Now, in, in personal finance, when I put a deposit, you know, into my account, that's not a liability. But it is for the bank because the bank owes me that money. Or if a company makes a deposit in a bank, the bank owes that money to that company. And so it really is a liability. And so they have to be able to take that money 
and disperse it. So banks make loans, they make investments to get a return on those dollars. So SVB could not make enough good loans, that's key, they couldn't make enough good loans fast enough to keep up with this just massive amount of money that was coming in through their deposits. So they take that excess money and they invest it in U.S. Treasury bonds and 10 years. So let's yeah. talk about that a little bit. Well, and, and I think they probably had various, yeah. you know, uh, durations of bonds in there, but they were. That's a key issue. Though. Yeah, they were stretching out longer because what you had during this time was interest rates on the floor. And we've got a, a graphic here that I want to share with you so you just kind of see what the environment was. And because most people don't live this like we do. But uh, Casey, if you'll throw up that, that graphic of the Federal Reserve, this is where we were. Look in 2020, the Fed cut interest rates to the floor. You see that the rate uh, was somewhere between zero and 0.3 percent, I believe it was. Uh, and then it stayed that way through 2022. So what Silicon Valley Bank did when all this money's flooding in is they bought those bonds. The problem is the bonds were at a low interest rate, so they stretched out in duration trying to get a little bit higher rate on those bonds. And they said, you know, we're, we're going to put a lot of money in this because we can't make these loans fast enough, and we've got to get some margin on, on these deposits. Right. So, John, fast forward to to this past you know several months or this past year and the storm hit that's right right when the fed started raising interest rates then that put pressure on the value of those bonds and janet this is something that we've talked about on this show it, for a long time it is uh, guys i got tickled about this last night i was talking about this whole deal um with the family and yes this is kind of what financial advisors talk about around the dinner table <laughs> sometimes <laughs> we do have other more exciting conversations but when big things are in the news we talk about things like this and my 16 year old daughter looked at me and she put her arms out to both sides in a seesaw motion and she said mom did they not know the seesaw story? Like, this is what's happening here. And so let me share with you the seesaw story. So bond prices and interest rates sit on opposite ends of the seesaw. It's a scientific relationship. It has never changed. It will never change. Chad, when one side of the seesaw goes down, what does the other one do? Well, when I was in elementary school, when I got on the seesaw, <laughs> The other side went up. Okay, so if you and I were <laughs> sitting on a seesaw, let's, yeah, let's do that. Do that yeah. yeah, if you and I are sitting on a seesaw, let's say that I'm sitting on the seesaw by myself. And obviously it's down on the ground because there's nobody on the other side. You come along and sit down on your side. What's going to happen to my side? You're going to go up. I'm going to go up, okay? <laughs> I like this game. Okay, so here's the deal. <clears throat> when you have a low interest rate environment, as interest rates go up, over time, which the Fed has caused to do, as interest rates go up, then bond prices on the opposite end of the seesaw have to go down. This is the way it works. That's never going to change. And here's the other thing. I know not everybody can see me. Some of you are just listening audio-wise. But if you have a short seesaw, like from the length of my pinky to my thumb, so a shorter term of a bond, the, the seesaw doesn't have as much wiggle room on either side. It doesn't go up as high or down as low, okay? But if you have a longer term of the bond, a longer seesaw, like I'm stretching my arms out all the way on both sides, then there's a bigger swing. That's what happens in a 10-year bond. When those interest rates started coming up, the bond value was down. So when the bank needed liquidity, in those 10-year holdings especially, and like John said, they were a little bit more diversified than that, but in those longer holdings, they're having to sell them at a measurable discount because you can go and get something better on the street right now today. Here's, here's the effect of this. I'm going to ask Casey to put that, uh, that graph back up for us, that graphic back up on the screen so our viewers can see it. Here's the formula. For a 10-year bond, if rates go up 1%, it changes the value it decreases the value of that bond roughly 10 percent so look at what rates did from the uh, beginning of 2022 the fed started increasing interest rates and they went from basically zero all the way to above four percent 
So when you look at a 10-year bond, you're probably looking somewhere in the neighborhood of a 40% decline in its interim value. Now, if they had had the luxury of holding that 10-year bond all the way to maturity, it would have matured and and paid its full value out at that particular point in time. But they didn't have that luxury because all of the uh, tech companies started pulling money out of the bank because higher interest rates had dried up all of the private equity money that they had been living on for a long time. Right. So, John, if you think about it from a personal level, if I've got $10,000 in the bank and I need $5,000, I'm not going to go borrow $5,000 now at a higher interest rate when I can go utilize my capital at this point. That's exactly right. So this demand on the deposits hits the bank. Everybody wants their money. We've seen this movie. It's called It's a Wonderful Life. You guys remember when, when you know, they're in the bank and they're, like, waiting for closing time. And at the end, I don't know, they got 2 or $3 left, you know, in there. And, but they made it. Their, their doors were able to close and they were able to satisfy all the demands. When a bank can't satisfy the demands then we have a problem like what we're looking at here. So word gets out on the street and on Twitter uh, that the bank is having problems. That prompts a run on the bank. Again, just like we saw in the movies, it prompts a run on the bank, and clients pulled out billions of dollars in less than 24 hours. So that's what you got. Now, let me make a quick editorial comment here. This is what happens when you have reckless government spending. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, when when the Santa Claus sleigh was flying over America and and you get money and you get money. That's right. (laughs) Nobody thought anything about it. Everybody's like, oh, there were a few of us that went, yeah, this is going to hurt when this all comes to fruition. Yeah. But this is what happens. You set about a, a, a just almost a domino effect of events. And then you have this unintended consequence albeit a very dangerous consequence of putting banks in a liquidity squeeze. So that's where we are as far as the bank situation is concerned. Let's talk about this relative to Gen Wealth. I know that we have already reached out and done some communicating to our clients, but we have, uh, we have no relationship at all with Silicon Valley Bank. So we don't have, you know, there's no need for our clients to be concerned about that or anything. But I had an interesting appointment that happened to, their review just happened to land this week right after the the news and everything about this bank story. And these particular clients, uh, this is not their retirement plan, this is some other reserves, and they have a, a good bit of CD money. It's not the normal Gen Wealth play, it's kind of out of the norm for us. But when we did that, guys, we spread it out across multiple banks at that two hundred and fifty thousand dollar limit right. on each time, and that was you know that was last year. That was well before this was an issue. You've got to be sure that you understand the the dangers in places that seem safe. You know, a bank it seems safe to make that deposit. A CD seems safe. Are you going to get your money back out of it? And so th- there are reasons behind everything that we do, guys. Well, and, and I think that it's, it's really important that uh, you, you uh, obviously understand from an uh, intellectual standpoint why this has happened yes. and the fact that, that uh, our, our uh, custodian of our assets, LPL Financial, doesn't have any money invested at Silicon Valley Bank or anything of that nature. They adhere to the $250,000 limit mm-hmm. on anything that they do. And so we, we feel like we're in, in really good shape as far as any of that risk is concerned. But let's talk about the broader picture here. And, you know, obviously we're in uncertain times. And we've got to ask the question, how do we stack the cards in our clients' favor? And how do you, as our clients, stack the cards in your favor when it comes to your retirement, your investments, and your money? Guys, I think it's really interesting that if you understand probabilities, the probability of someone experiencing success in retirement, unless they do a lot of planning, is probably around 50%. And when the odds of success at that point are basically just like flipping a coin. But if you just interject simple planning into the equation, those odds can dramatically increase. 
Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, when you look at uh, we talk about this every once in a while, you know, wh- what if your odds when you're getting on the airplane, what if your odds were 50% of success and 50% failure? I'll you drive. Know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chad's <laughs> like, I'll drive. No, no way I'm going to fly. But yet with retirement, I, I think the difference is, number one, life or death, um, but, but people put money pretty close to that. But number two, it is the, the knowledge and the awareness of it. I think that people don't know that, okay, if I don't plan – then odds are 50-50 about whether my retirement will be successful or not. So let's give everybody a reminder about an opportunity of how you can dramatically increase your chances at success in retirement right now if you are not planning at all. If you've not done any retirement planning, here's your opportunity. We have a half-off financial plan uh, we call it uh, avoid the it's, madness. It, it, it because yeah, we're, March, we're, in, we're in March madness, so we yeah. talk about market madness right now. Yeah. So, so join the madness. You can get half off of your financial plan if you book it. it. The appointment doesn't have to actually occur in March, but you have to contact us and get it on the calendar in the month of March. John, how do they how do they contact us to well, make that happen? Well, they simply text us at uh, 501-381-5228 and just text the word madness, the word madness to 501-381-5228. Or you can call us at 866-653-PLAN. That's 866-653-7526. Half off financial plan. That's a great opportunity to raise the odds of you uh, being uh, financially well in retirement from 50% to, you know, on average, you're going to be somewhere in the 80, 85% range just simply by planning. Right. But when you plan with Gen Wealth, we really, Chad, take a different approach to this probability thing. We're, we're not into probabilities here. No, no. Can you imagine just uh, starting, you know, Coach Musselman starting out the week? You know, they've known who they're going to play since what, Sunday? Yep. And done zero planning. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. You know, there's what, 64 teams going into the bracket? Right. But think about all the planning that has taken place just this week Mm -hmm. before they roll the ball out. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I can't comprehend is if you walked out of retirement your last day of work and you had a 50-50 chance without any planning. Yes. You know, so the thing about that, you know, we would consider that complete madness. Yeah. Right. In in our books. But you don't have to. You don't have to. Our resources are here and available to you guys. You know, one of the things that we pride ourselves on at Gen Wealth, and and I, I had this conversation with a client the other day, and they had several hundred thousand dollars, but they they just didn't call us back because they didn't feel like they had enough to deal with. And we consider we would consider that madness. Uh, we right? we respect all levels of wealth That's at Gen right. Wealth. Absolutely, guys. I, I want to talk about how we kind of remove some of the uncertainty from retirement and switch from these fifty fifty odds to improving it, putting the odds in your favor. Um, we've had Dr. Wade Fowl on uh, on the show before. He's been a guest with us. We are uh, pretty big fans of him at the American College. He's a professor there, noted retirement researcher. He said, guys, that about a third of the population is comfortable with the assumptions and preferences required to make a, quote, safe withdrawal rate work. But that leaves about two-thirds of people looking for something else, and that something else is certainty. And, guys, we, we see it all the time that um, people come in initially in their first meeting with GenWealth with... Uh, there is a larger dose of uncertainty in their lives than anything else. Like it is a really big deal. That is why we do the planning that we do. And we do it in such a way that it is also making a portion of their income certain. It is, it is coming to them on a guaranteed basis, which when you think about when the market goes crazy, when a bank collapses, when you hear something that causes you to have fear or concern, you want to seek certainty. You know, where, where the rubber meets the road on this, guys, is you have probability planners who will use something like the 4% rule to base their planning on, and the 4% rule works until it doesn't. It is a probability-based retirement planning strategy. 
we don't use that strategy at GenWealth. We believe that people want income that is regular, predictable, and dependable. I know that I've got bills every month that are going to come in. Yeah. Even if I'm retired, I've got, uh, you know, a utility mortgage bills. and utility bills and, and property taxes and insurance and y- you name it, their food and clothing and transportation, all of those things. That income that you have in your retirement income plan, that income's got to show up every month. There can't be any probability of it not showing up. And so we believe in in what we call a flooring and bucketing strategy Mm -hmm. uh, that allows for us to essentially, I like to say it this way, because if I'm going to gamble, I'm going to play blackjack. And why is that? And because the odds are in my favor. Yeah. Because I have some control over what's going on. If I'm playing roulette, it's total chance. But if I'm playing blackjack, then I've got a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, opportunity to you know, control the outcome, Chad. It is, but, you know, the casinos also build their business on probabilities. That's right. And uh, that's one of the things that we don't we don't want to do here at GenWealth is build our business off of probabilities it, because that can get very risky. And it also makes you, without the plan, it makes you be more reactive instead of proactive. And I so think that's the biggest key is that we want to be proactive in, in the decisions that we're making. Absolutely. So, In the world of financial independence, how do you stack the odds in your favor, the odds of success? You do that by creating a strategy for for meeting those basic living expenses with guaranteed or highly predictable income. Guys, let's talk about where that can come from. Um, Social Security is a a check that you're going to have till death do us part. Your, if you have a pension, your pension is, is probably set up. There are some that are a time period, but most of those are going to give you a lifetime payout. And then beyond that, there are products that can give you a guaranteed income stream if you need it. But we want to look at what is your guaranteed, your required income need, and let's match that required income need with guaranteed income sources. So if you say to us, We have to have $4,000 a month every month. We just have to, have to, have to have that. Okay, let's look at those sources of guaranteed income. And if you're at $3,000, then you've got a gap. And we've got to go to a product that's going to fill that gap and get you to that $4,000 marker. If you have $5,000 in income coming in on a guaranteed basis, you don't have a gap. We've got your guaranteed uh, income already covered, and then we can focus in other areas. But, guys, this takes away the rolling of the dice, if you will. It does. And, Janet, you know, I've been here with GenWealth now five years. Mm -hmm. And prior to coming on with GenWealth, I was in the insurance world. And you were in our office a lot. So you've you've really got like 15 years with us. I've (laughs) I've been around. And and probably like some of the listeners, they've heard you guys tell about the guaranteed income sources and how we're going to cover your guaranteed expenses. But now that I get to put this into practice and see this with clients and actually friends Mm -hmm. that are in retirement, uh, just so recently uh, sat down with a, a client of mine and just very nervous about the, the values on the statement and the noise that she yeah. hears in the oh, media yeah. and just doing her annual review. You know, I was able to walk her through with here's your guaranteed income sources. Here's the way the bucket one is going to provide. And we've got, you know, just being able to explain to her till 2027, here's what your income is going to come from. Yeah. And exactly. And there's not going to be any changes in that income. And so just the process of walking her through, you know, Mm -hmm. are your guaranteed expenses met? And here on your statement shows where this money is going to come to you until 2027. She was much more appreciative of what we've been able to put together for. It's the ability to look at a longer time period and understand how the plan is going to work over that period of time. If we go back to earlier in the show when we were talking about Silicon Valley Bank, you know, one of the one of the critical mistakes that they made, guys, was assuming that things moving forward were going to be like things were at the point that they bought those bonds. Well, things changed, and they weren't ready for that change. But the same thing is true, you know, many times in a positive way, when you're looking at what's going on right now in the economy and, and what your balance is on this particular investment, you know what? Things change. Give it time. And if that investment is guaranteed, okay, you're good. 
And if that investment is something that you're not going to need for the next 15 or 20 years, then let's not focus on right now today and make decisions based on right now today. Because if you do that in a, in a different way, you're really repeating the same mistake that that bank made. You're making decisions for the future based on right now never changing. I had a conversation with a client just yesterday. He called and said, can you buy treasury bonds? <laughs> and I said, I can that's not a problem. Well, I think we might ought to do that with all this stuff going on. And I said, okay, let's stop and think about this for a second. Because he was talking about in his long-term bucket, in his equity bucket. It's he a wanted long to, seesaw, isn't it, he John? Wa- he wanted to get out of those and get into treasury bonds because in short-term, tra- he was smart enough to go okay. six months or, or something like that. He just wanted to kind of get past all of this yeah. is basically what I, he said. I said to him, look, we know there's going to be inflation in the future. We already know that. You've got a lot of fixed income instruments in terms of your annuity income and your other fixed interest assets that are paying you interest right now. You don't want your whole portfolio in fixed income. You want to have a hedge against inflation in the future. That's that looking ahead Mm -hmm. and saying, what's my need going to be six years from now, not six months from now? We've got six months taken care of. That's not a problem. Six years from now, 16 years from now, 26 years from now, what's the situation going to be like? And we know that equities and real estate are the only two asset classes that have staved off inflation. So that was a conversation we had. I also wanted to to talk about another graphic that we've got here. This one uh, comes from uh, JP Morgan. It is a goals-based wealth management strategy. And I think that this is something that a lot of people need to to latch on to. And this may be a little bit hard to read, but essentially what this is saying is that if you look at any one year period of time, equities could be, you know, anywhere on the chart, it could lose 25 or 30 percent, or it could go up 25 or 30 percent. But the further you get out in terms of time, then the more high the probability is of equities actually giving you a positive performance. And if you go out over 15 years, history tells us that there's never been an S&P 500 uh, portfolio ever perform at a negative rate of return over 15 years. That's why equities need to be labeled as long-term investments to help you hedge inflation because that stacks the odds in your favor. Yeah. Let's also talk about some other things that you need to think about when it comes to stacking the odds in your favor in retirement income planning. And one of those that is really, I think, uh, people use a knee-jerk reaction to this when it comes up, and that is how to claim Social Security. Because Social Security is a big deal. It is part of the foundation of your retirement Mm -hmm. income. And, Chad, if they just make the knee-jerk reaction of claiming at 62 because they think the government's going to run out of money, they're making a mistake. Especially when you've got a, a, a household, a husband and wife, and maybe there's an age gap there. Or you got to take in consideration all the other income sources. So there may be some situations where it really makes sense to delay. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. When we when we look at that social security strategy, the claiming strategy is for the household, not for an individual. And you know, when you get your statement, it's just your individual statement. It doesn't include anything relative to your household, much less relative to the entire financial picture that you and your family have. Guys, I want to circle back to what John was talking about a moment ago about equities and, you know, given time that they perform well for us, but we tend to look at them over a shorter period of time. John, we have told the the yo-yo story for 20 years probably now. At some point, we're going to film this, but I don't think we have anybody who can do a yo-yo. I I personally (laughs) cannot, so I'm going to just try to tell you the story instead of doing the visual. At my house, we have 18 steps. I know it's probably weird that I know that, but I count things. This is the way my brain works. So we have 18 steps going from the first floor up to the second floor. And Chad's laughing that I know that. So anyway. I'm laughing because it's not 17 steps. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, there's a story there. Picture if I were able to actually use a yo-yo. And I started on the ground floor, and that yo-yo, as I'm walking up the steps, that yo-yo is going up and down and up and down in my hand. Okay, when I get to the third step, the You the fall down because you're not coordinated <laughs> enough to pull that <laughs> Are off. Are you going to let me tell my story? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> when, you, when I get to the third step and the yo-yo is at its down point, 
if you just look at from the second step to the third step, then we're down. That, that doesn't look good. But we weren't planning on, you know, stopping the yo-yo game on the third step. We were planning on staying on this for 18 steps, right? So as we now continue to go up the stairs, by the time I get to the 18th step, even if the yo-yo is at a down point on the 18th step, guess what, guys? It's higher than it was at the high point on the third step, on the fifth step, on the 10th, and even on the 15th. It's it's up relative to a longer point in time in history ago okay so that's that's the type of that's the way that we need to look at our investing it is not about from step two to step three it is not about the last 12 months of your investing it is about a 20 or a 30 year time period and what does it do when it's given time to do what its purpose is and janet you can also use those steps as the noise yeah. Because there's going to yeah. be more noise down the road. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be other things. It may not be a bank next time, but, John, you've been doing this long enough to know that there's another step coming, right? There's always another step coming, and there's always a lot of noise out there. And, and really and truly, you can go back in history and look, you know, for the past 100 years, there's always been some reason for you not to invest. Mm -hmm. there, there's been mm -hmm. some big crisis going on. You go, man, I better wait. I, I bet. And that is a losing strategy. You're now yes. stacking the cards against you instead of for you because we know some certain things are going to happen. And I think when it comes to your financial independence, guys, it should not be dependent upon the same circumstance that happens in a casino game. Casinos play the odds. And they, but they, what they really know at a casino is they know they've got long-term strategies for making out on, on the gambling that's going on. They know that you might win a hand or two here or there, but a long term, we're going to make money. And that's really what an investor has got to look at in their financial planning is long term. How is this going to work out for me? Not just in the short term, what are things going to be like? And I think that that's the critical thing. And guys, that's really why I believe that people need to take advantage of this half off financial plan during March Madness right now because if you're not planning, you raise your odds dramatically just by engaging in the process of planning. But aside from that, you've got to look at the situation of going, how can I create certainty in my retirement? How can I create a comfort level that I can go sleep at night? I can go, you know, be in a situation where I know where my next paycheck is coming from. Even after the, the work paycheck stops, how am I going to continue the stream of income that's coming in as a result of, of the things that I've done from a financial standpoint to make me financially independent? Look at you. See how I did that? Good job. Amazing. <laughs> that is the final bell. We are wrapping up our show right now, and we will uh, take some final thoughts. Let's start with Janet first. So I want to give you an opportunity to meet Chad in person if you haven't done that. Uh, Chad Roller and Teresa Arago will be with Chris Rippey, uh, an estate planning attorney in Conway with Rippey Steps and Associates, talking about how to protect your family through estate planning. So if you, if you believe it's important to you to secure your legacy for future generations, then we believe it's important for you to be there to learn. Remember that we are education-driven, strategy-based, and team-delivered. We will be available for you uh, at a no-cost workshop on April 4th at 6.30 p.m. on the Hendricks College campus, and that'll be at uh, Worsham Hall. Is that how you say that? I, it is. I'm, it not, is a, I'm not a Hall. Hendricks person. Mm -hmm. I, I went to UCA, but they'll forgive me for that, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but anyway, if you'd like to join us for that, all you need to do is uh, just check out our website, getreadyforthefuture.com. You can check it out there and uh, forward slash estate planning, so getreadyforthefuture.com forward slash estate planning yeah and I think today you know it sums up being proactive versus reactive and the plan is what helps you be able to do that so whether it's in your state estate plan or whether it's your financial plan being proactive and putting a plan together helps you not uh, be able to block out that noise and I'll, I'll wrap things up by saying that it is human nature to seek certainty with something as, as complex as retirement planning is, it can be difficult to find that. But just hoping it all works out 
is not a plan. Hope is absolutely not a plan. You need to engage with our half-off financial planning special that we've got going on. Text MADNESS to 501-381-5228. That's 501-381-5228. Or give us a call at 866-653-PLAN. That's 7526. That's going to wrap it up for the Get Ready for the Future show for this weekend. For Janet Walker and Chad Roller, the entire Gen Wealth team, I'm John Shrewsbury. Have a great time, and we will see you next week. The Gen Wealth Financial Team is available to you 24 7 at info at getreadyforthefuture.com or call our offices at 866 653 PLAN. That's 866-653-7526. You should personally consult a financial advisor before making any investment, and no strategy can assure success. Securities offered through LPL Financial. Member FINRA SIPC. Investment advice offered through Independent Advisor Alliance. Independent Advisor Alliance and GenWealth Financial Advisors are separate entities from LPL Financial.